Nigel, to my mind, you were one of the first mainstream political figures when I became politically aware that was talking about immigration. Why is it that immigration is such a taboo subject in this country? And if you come out in favour of limiting immigration, that immediately paints you as being far right and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I've long believed that the greatest intellectual that we had in post-war politics in Britain was Enoch Powell. I mean, I, I mean, you know, hard to disagree with that. I mean, the man was extraordinary. The man was brilliant. The man was very far-sighted. And if I look at what he was saying about the common market in 1972, it's all come true. But, but the speech that he gave in 1968, the speech that became known as the Rivers of Blood speech, I think it was so ill-judged in terms of its tone and the way that it was allowed to be interpreted, that it almost put the tin lid on having a sensible immigration debate for decades after that. And I think that did real, real damage. When I was first elected in 1999, on all of my election literature, the word immigration didn't appear. Didn't appear. Why? because net migration into Britain was averaging about 30,000 a year. It was still at a level that concerned some people, but it was, let's be honest about it, it was pretty manageable. And I looked at things in the late nineties, and I compared assimilation, integration of different communities in the United Kingdom, and compare it to France and Germany, or, or the Netherlands, or anywhere else in Europe. You know, we'd done this better than anybody else. We really had done this better than anybody else. So I didn't even discuss immigration. And the same applied in 2000, 2001, 2002. When I saw, when I saw that what Blair had done was to open the doors effectively to the world, but then especially to open the doors to eight and then 10 former communist countries, some of whom had minimum wages, that were seven, eight times lower than the British minimum wage, some of which had not made the transition from being communist states to free Western economies. And when Mr. Blair told us that 13,000 people a year would arrive as a result of this, I thought, this is the moment. This is going to become the issue. So I made a very big call in 2004, a very big call. I said that millions would come. I said huge numbers would come to Britain. I said it would have a very damaging effect on you know, the life of lots of ordinary people. Um, and so that was the moment. That was the moment that immigration became part of my political fight. Why does it matter so much? Well, of course, it doesn't matter mm. if you're a cabinet minister. It doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're a big business owner, because it means cheaper nannies, cheaper gardeners, and cheap labor. But it matters hugely to everybody else because we did unquestionably see compression of labor, uh, crises with our primary schools, just not simply being able to cope with the numbers, um, and, and you know, disjointed communities where you know, the numbers coming in that spoke foreign languages or from different cultures were so fast that we weren't getting that level of integration that we need to have a settled, happy society. So without immigration, without well, there are two things actually, without immigration and without the internet, you know, UKIP would have remained a fringe force in British politics, but those two things propelled it to where it got to. Mm. And Nigel, all three of us, I'm a, I came to this country in 1995 from a former Soviet country uh, in Russia. And I, I remember actually the point that you make, the levels were so low, no one really cared about immigration. I think the public concern about immigration at the time was about 3% in 1995. It changed when you got here. <laughs> it changed when I got here, absolutely. <laughs> I, I single-handedly ruined it. Um, but, but you understand, but, I mean, coming from your background, you understand what I mean. I mean, yeah, countries, I like, countries like Bulgaria, and Romania, which is so much in the grip of organized crime, you know, we the sensible thing to do would have been to be cautious, but we weren't. And 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 of course, I was called all sorts of things for daring to say this. Uh, this, 
But that was how ordinary folk felt. And and you know yourself, having come here in 1995, that you know you would not find a country in the European time zone more welcoming and more open than this. In, in the world, Nigel. In the world, I make this point to people all the time. All the time. Britain is one of the most tolerant and welcoming places in the entire history of the human race. And that really was what shifted my thoughts on a lot of this stuff because I saw after the referendum, in which I was a very strong Remain supporter at the time, suddenly the explanation for why Brexit happened was that everybody in this country was racist. And that's when I went, no, that isn't true. That's not my experience as a dark skinned immigrant in this country. Yeah, that was disgusting. I mean, let's be honest about it. You know, talking to you guys, you're Remainers, but you're Democrats, so you accept the result. That's great, of course. You know, that's how it should be. But frankly, the behaviour of large sections of our elected politicians in Westminster to completely refuse to accept the result of the, of the referendum, to denigrate, as you've just pointed out, those who dared to vote against the establishment view, and then every attempt to prevent it from happening or make us vote again. I honestly think that in a hundred years time, we will look back at the history of this period and school kids will be taught that it was one of the most shameful episodes in what is supposed to be a democratic country. So did you get what you wanted, Nigel? Because we've got Brexit. Uh, we, we got the Australian style point system that you were talking about, right? That that's, we've got a, a Tory government. Uh, but the numbers of people coming into the country are the same as they ever were. Oh, yes. I mean, look, you know, the Conservative Party are not a Conservative Party. Mm. I mean, I mean <laughs> it's just a complete misnomer. Um, and, and Boris Johnson and the sort of posh boys around him, um, they don't regard immigration as an issue. They used it briefly in the referendum, very briefly in the referendum, because it suited their purposes to do so. Um, and you're right, uh, net migration is still running at very, very high levels. And we also face a very big dilemma as to what to do about Hong Kong. And I say big dilemma because, you know, I am very concerned about the influence the Chinese Communist Party is having upon the free world, upon its own world too. And yet, you know, what would it mean if 300,000 or 3 million people came and settled in the United Kingdom from Hong Kong. So, so I think that is the time when the immigration debate will be back on. Um, for the moment, for the moment, uh, the Conservatives are able to get away with something, which is the public perception is that because of Brexit, we've dealt with the issue. The truth is we haven't. The truth is we haven't. And look, you, you know, you asked me that question. I mean, the truth is that you never, ever get everything you want in victory. Sometimes losing's easier. <laughs> it's a bit like trading the markets. You know, you've got a position on the markets. It's going wrong. You can't sleep for a week. You get rid of the position. You take your loss. You feel almost a sense of relief that it's over. When you've got a winning trade, you always say, oh, I should have done it in a bigger size. I should have got out a bit earlier. Victory is never perfect. But look, when I see what's happened with our withdrawal from the European Medicines Agency and the fact that we've been able to act in the interest of our own people with the vaccine rollout compared to the absolute shambles in Brussels, uh, that I think, that I think, will be the lasting testament as to why being in control of national decisions and having those decisions made by people directly accountable to us is a better way of doing things. So look, I'm not happy about the fishing deal. I'm very unhappy about Northern Ireland being cast out. Uh, there are some ridiculous things going on um, you know, with goods at our borders, but overall, overall, we're in a good place. And you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Just a few days ago, we've learned that the 25% tariff on Scotch whiskey, something that really hurts. You know, Scotland's got enough economic problems without that industry, with nearly 50,000 people working in and around Scotch whiskey, that because we've left the European Union, we've been able to negotiate that tariff being suspended. So I think there are lots of arguments and lots of reasons that will say to us 
as the years go by, that Brexit was the right thing to do. And I think those debates and those questions will now be asked in European capitals as well.